thank you again for uh, joining us today for Middle School CTE Classroom Management, Enhancing the Learning Experience. Today, our presenter is Dr. Mario Minichino. He is the Vice President of Curriculum Development at CTEC Associates, Inc. And just a little about his background. Um, he brings over 30 years of combined industry and education experience to the design and development of workforce, of workforce development and CTE programs, implementing the best practices in his classroom and real-world applications. Uh, we'll have his contact info at the very end if you'd like to email him with questions or would like some more resources. Uh, but for now, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Minichino to begin the seminar. Thank you very much, Celia. And uh, before we get started, I wanted to thank you and ACTE for hosting this uh, seminar so we can uh, have our members get a little bit more professional development as they're going through their years. Uh, before we get started with this, uh, I also wanted to make sure that I let everybody know this is a condensation of a uh, year-long uh, syllabus that I teach, or semester-long syllabus that I teach. And uh, uh, it's been condensed in some areas, expanded in others, but uh, hopefully we'll cover enough information today where it will help you improve your teaching in a middle school uh, CTE classroom. So today's seminar, before we get started, I want to go over uh, what I mean by CTE classroom management in the 21st century. So I just want to kind of touch on the different things that we're going to go over today. So first we're going to examine what we mean by classroom management. Uh, then we're going to take a look at the type of teacher that you are now, or the type of teacher that you can be. We're going to go over a little bit more on enhancing the learning process. Let's talk about how middle school learners learn develop some classroom guidelines. Um, I use classroom guidelines all the time rather than classroom rules, and you'll see what the difference is when we get there. Uh, we're going to talk about some effective classroom designs for a CTE classroom. We're going to talk specifically about one design in particular called workstations, so we're going to define that and see how they work. Uh, and then we're going to talk about presenting your class in a workstation format. At the end, I'll follow up with a, a lesson plan example so you can get an idea of how you would differentiate your presentation in the workstation format for the different stations that will uh, be presented. So first, let's talk a little bit about classroom management. We want to ask the question, really, what is classroom management? Well, we can come up with our own definition or we could talk to a couple of experts. In this case, we can go to Doug Limoff from his 2010 book, Teach Like a Champion, and look at what he says about it. And his definition is of classroom management is the wide variety of skills and techniques that teachers use to keep students organized, orderly, focused, on task, and academically productive. In his a book, Teach Like a Champion, he has some really great suggestions. However, if you start analyzing those suggestions, a lot of them rely on routine, routines and procedures. Routines and procedures. Think about routines and procedures for a while. Another uh, couple who are really effective in classroom management for uh, quite some time, Harry and Rosemary Long, uh, in their book, The First Days of School, How to Be an Effective Teacher from 2005. Their definition, they start with the, the uh, um, explanation that classroom management is not discipline and it should not be punitive. They go further to say that uh, classroom management is the practices and procedures that allow teachers to teach and students to learn. But again, they focus a lot on routines and procedures. In fact, one of uh, their um, uh, recommendations to a student and a teacher to tell a student is when the teacher is lecturing that the student should have their eyes on the speaker, they should be quiet, they should be still, their hands should be free, and they should listen. Uh, that's pretty interesting 
information to give a, a young child in middle school who's really excited about being in the class, and you're trying to get them excited to, to be involved in the class. So in our classrooms in middle school, especially CTE classrooms, we're working with a variety of different students, and they're doing a variety of different tasks. Do we really want them to fall into routines and procedures every day? So that begs the question, is this still true? Is that advice from Limov and from the Wong still true? So to teach 21st century skills, we really need to be 21st century teachers. So what do we mean by a 21st century teacher? 21st century teacher term is, is generally used to refer to certain core competencies that the teacher possesses, such as collaborative ability, digital literacy, critical thinking and problem solving skills, and an ability to adapt to the needs of the student, to the lesson, and to the learning opportunities. Uh, if you've been in the classroom long enough, you'll have recognized many opportunities where learning opportunities take place and you switch off from your lesson plan and follow that learning opportunity. Also, 21st century teachers need to be lifelong learners, and that's something that may be a little bit different than we've experienced in the past. Uh, 21st century teachers need to understand that these, their students are exploring the real world of work. And what this means is they're looking for employability skills. Every time I sit down with uh, industry experts and employers, they keep telling me the same things, that they're looking for these soft skills in their students. And it's never too early to start them. Middle school is actually the best time to start teaching these soft skills. Collaboration, communication, job-related discipline that's showing up on time, staying until the work is completed. Having a competency with technology, an ability to adapt to changes on, on the uh, work site. Having digital skills, problem-solving techniques, and critical thinking processes. And one other one that's really big with employers is customer relations. So what is the real effect of routine? If we think about routine, what happens with routine? Well, think about a student who has six classes a day in six different classrooms with six different teachers and six different routines. Each of those routines becomes important to follow because the teacher is insisting on the routine. Does the student really understand which routine uh, is important in which class and why? So, uh, just recently, uh, we've had some research on routines in the classroom, and the outcome is pretty clear. Uh, routine tasks hinder creativity in the classroom. They prevent the student from really wanting to explore, and that's our job in the middle school, is to help students begin to explore. So would you rather have your students following a procedure or exploring and learning more? And we're going to examine the, the concept of why today's middle school classroom management is different. Um, and that's because faced with the need for exploration, teachers need to adapt. They need to take a look at their classroom management activities and adapt to it. We also uh, want to start taking a look at enhanced learning. And enhanced learning uh, is a classroom experience and I want to take a, a new point of view on classroom management, especially classroom management for middle school CTE classrooms. Classroom management really should be an enhancement of the classroom learning experience. It should provide attachment points for, uh, the, to the content for different learning styles while supporting exploration and student-centered growth. Our job as middle school uh, teachers is to Develop, help develop independent learners who have ownership over their uh, um, education, uh, provide them opportunities for success, and differentiate the learning for them 
so they're successful. They find attachment points to it. Uh, really enhancing the learning aspect of, of classroom management is where classroom management should focus, not on discipline, as the Wong say, not on discipline, but on enhancing the learning experience. It shouldn't be about routines and procedures. So let's take a look at what type of teacher you are right now and what you can be. So how do we define the perfect teacher for the 21st century? It really comes down to the right mixture of challenge and support. Challenge and support uh, means that a, sorry, I gotta go back. I keep losing my place instead of doing it off the top of my head, I keep uh, referring back to my notes. We should have recorded the other one. Yeah, no worries, it's fine. So what type of teacher are you? That's, that's a good question for a lot of teachers. Uh, and how do we define the perfect teacher for the 21st century? When I teach this class, I like to um, ask this question to uh, my teachers who are in training. I ask them what type of teacher they are now. And most of them have developed their uh, method of teaching and their style of teaching from what they experience themselves. But we want to take a look at what type of teacher is the best type of teacher for the 21st century. So that teacher uh, should have the right mixture of challenge and support. What do we mean by challenge and support? Well, we mean that challenge should allow the student to constantly reach out to, as Piaget would say, constantly be off balance, to push themselves further and further. Uh, fortunately, um, teachers who are really good at challenging students are also really good at supporting them. So if we can have the teacher who is the warm demander, uh, the teacher who is very adamant about the challenge, I'm gonna give you a very strong challenge, but I'm also going to support you in the Lev Vygotsky concept of scaffolding. I'm going to be there to help build this process for you where you can step from concept to concept and do better and better as you go through. So ask yourself, are you supportive in the classroom? Do you provide the supports that students need so occasionally when they reach a roadblock, they can turn to you and get that type of help? And are you challenging? Do you keep raising the bar for them to continue to move? Right now, research has shown us that there are four types of teachers, and we're going to go over each one of these teachers, but uh, for, uh, each one of these types, but I want to outline the four types for you first. So we have the authoritarian teacher. I'm sure we've all had one of these. The permissive teacher. I had a few of those myself. Detached. I worked with many of those. An authoritative teacher, and that's the type that I really try and uh, be myself. So the authoritarian teacher uh, uses this type of style. They're typically really strict taskmasters. They're the type of teacher who you come into the classroom and it's sit down, be quiet. They want to maintain a quiet classroom. They adhere to a very established routine. Think back to what Limov and the Wongs have said about routines. They establish classroom control through loud speech or noises. Uh, I've been in classes or next to uh, teachers in classes where they bang on the wall or smash uh, something on a desktop to catch everyone's attention. They organize their classroom in rows. Everything is very tightly organized. They tend to allow little classroom interaction between students. And when you're working on collaboration at this point in a student's uh, uh, development, uh, you need that interaction. They typically utilize a lot of seat work and lecture because they know and they want to tell. And the seat work tends to be easy for them to manage. They have a very high demand level. They demand excellence but they have a low, very low warmth level. They don't provide a lot of support. The next type is the permissive teacher, and the permissive teachers 
often have anything goes classrooms. I'm sure you've had teachers like this uh, near you uh, in your building, or uh, maybe you've actually had this as a teacher. Uh, they're usually seen by students as being too nice. Uh, a permissive teacher typically doesn't put a lot of pressure on students. Yes, that's okay, this is good enough. If classrooms that are seen by fellow teachers and students alike is being too loud, it's hard to concentrate in these classrooms. They focus on effort instead of on results. Uh, making sure that everybody's happy is their uh, goal in the classroom and usually not the uh, covering the content. More concerned about a student's feelings and their application of discipline is very inconsistent. Sometimes they will uh, be very strict, other times very lax. Students don't know how to act. They rarely assign challenging projects. It typically becomes lowering the bar rather than raising it. And they typically have little to no classroom organization. You can usually tell that it's a permissive teacher by walking into a classroom of theirs and seeing everything piled everywhere. Uh, typically, the students don't put things back where they should be and really don't care about that. They have a low demand level, but a very high warmth level. Students tend to like them, but don't learn a lot in their classes. Then we have the uninvolved teacher. Teachers who use this style, they tend to use a lot of handouts and busy work. I've had teachers like this uh, uh, who worked in the same building I did, and they showed a lot of videos. Um, oftentimes uh, running five videos a week rather than teaching. Most often, they're not supportive of student needs. If the student needs something, wants to go to the office, the bathroom, they really aren't very supportive of those needs. They're not very supportive academically as well. They're usually desk sitters who rarely leave their command centers. Uh, I had one uh, teacher who taught English uh, near me, and he had a command center set up where he blocked everyone out, three desks all surrounding his, and had everything electrically controlled from his command center, so he didn't have to leave there. His students knew that when they came in, they picked up their sheet of paper, went and did their work, and handed it after the bell rang, and they left. They grade dispassionately. They typically focus on completeness rather than accuracy, and that's one of the reasons why they use a lot of handouts. They're typically seen as untrustworthy by fellow teachers and the students and they rarely respond to disruptive behavior. And what I mean by that is, unless the behavior gets out of control in the classroom, they rarely respond to the noise or to uh, a problem that uh, is happening in front of them. They have a very low demand level and a low warmth level. They're not trusted by the students or the teachers. Finally, we have the authoritative teacher. And teachers who use this style have caring and supportive classrooms. They design their uh, uh, classrooms and their lessons around trying to get the students to reach forward while supporting them. They establish realistic classroom expectations, so it's not extremely high demand or extremely low demand. It's a realistic one that supports growth. Students are empowered to succeed in this type of a classroom because an authoritative teacher tends to hand over control to the student over their own learning. Their classroom organization fits the need, and what I mean by that is it's adaptable, it's changeable. Uh, classroom organization for an authoritative teacher uh, can be chairs and tables, it can be uh, workstations, it can be a variety of different settings. Basically, what fits the need of that particular lesson is how they organize the classroom. So it's not fixed or static, but very malleable. They're usually seen by students as being firm, but very caring. In other words, the student can go to them and say, uh, I need some help with this, and the teacher is willing to help and give extensions on deadlines, but very firm on their grading. They work with students to establish the classroom guidelines, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. 
uh, establishing classroom guidelines is a really big part of effective CTE classroom management. They run a democratic, a democratic classroom, meaning that they make sure that the students are involved in the decisions. And they're typically open to communication, debate, and discussion, which is important uh, for a student. We want a student to make sure that they understand that they can question things, they can ask why, they can have a debate back and forth because that's building on their adult behaviors that they need to establish. Classroom management is usually student-centered, meaning that students become directly involved in the management process uh, and are active members of the management team. This type of teacher has a high demand level and a very high warmth level. Uh, students usually like this type of teacher and will uh, look back and uh, contact them and tell them how happy they were to have them as a teacher in years to come. So mo most effective teaching style for the 21st century middle school classroom is authoritative. And this is out of research of a variety of styles from a variety of different studies. Because it provides the best combination of support and challenge strong support for self-regulated behavior. Remember, we were trying to take uh, young people who are just having an emergent concept of self and get them to begin to regulate their own behavior. They're flexible and able to adjust to classroom conditions. Uh, when things occur and there's a learning opportunity that happens in the classroom, they don't revert back to the lesson plan just because they've got to cover that objective today. They take advantage of this opportunity and adapt to it. They incorporate the key soft skills needed for the future for their students and for industry. A lot of these students will eventually end up working in a company or a business somewhere, and they need to understand the importance of those soft skills. They're very democratic, open to change, and open to suggestions from the class. Very supportive of the innovative mindset uh, if things emerge out of the students or out of the class or out of the groups, they're open to incorporating them into their classroom. So ask yourself, is this your teaching style? If it is, you can achieve a high level of success teaching 21st century learners. Let's talk a little bit about those learners. So middle school learners, Armstrong would say that social, emotional, and metacognitive growth are the important parts of that middle school learner. And if he says if they're required to learn in classrooms that are largely emphasized lecture, textbooks, written assignments, and tests, their motivation is likely to wane. He says this because he believes that the content needs to be presented in context, not in isolation. If you think about a typical academic classroom, we teach specific skill sets. We don't always teach the skills in application, and that's one of the big benefits of CTE. There needs to be time for exploration. Middle school design is uh, there to enable students to discover their particular abilities, talents, interests, values, and preferences. And this was the concept that came out of the National Middle School Association in 1965. It's something that we haven't done a really good job of. Um, we've been focusing more on academic skills and less on that time for exploration. It's the time where they are out there to critically examine the real world of work before entering high school in a set pathway. And if you think of the importance of that, uh, if you get into the wrong high school and you start down the wrong CTE pathway in a high school, you may not be able to switch from one group to another. Uh, you may have, uh, if you do, have to repeat a lot of courses. Middle school learners have that emergence of self where they're concerned about their safety. Um, they like to work in small learning communities because of that. They're looking for personal adult relationships. Uh, I read a study the other day that said that the average middle school student only spends about five minutes a day with their parents. Uh, that's really not a lot of time. So they're looking for those personal adult relationships uh, with other adults, and 
you're with that student for an hour. So you can be a really good positive role model because that's what they're looking for. They want to be engaged in their learning. They really are interested in learning. That's why they keep coming to school. They keep thinking things will get better. But they need meaningful curriculum to be able to engage them and keep them focused. So let's talk a little bit about how we can keep them focused. And one way is developing classroom guidelines. Classroom guidelines are uh, not rules. They're the set of practices that are uh, uh, followed in the classroom as a means of having the classroom manage itself. Students need to be involved in the real world decision making to develop these skills for themselves. If they're not involved in making rules for themselves or guidelines for themselves to follow, they really don't know how to do it when they get out of school. So I follow this five-day practice, and you would think following this five-day practice, uh, I don't have five days to put into developing guidelines. I'd rather just establish some rules and have the students follow them. Well, if you structure this correctly, you can have each day help support the concepts that you're looking to teach, especially those employability skills. So you can address them right up at the beginning. I like to start on day one by helping the class form groups, and then those groups identify guideline classification. So a group may be focused on identifying uh, how to use the bathroom, what are different ways that uh, we could use the bathroom. Another group may be involved in how to uh, get things uh, handed out in the classroom. Uh, it may be something very simple like talking in the classroom, uh, how to quiet a classroom, different things like that. So we identify those classifications first. On day two, we get down to the specific types of things that need to be permitted and not permitted. Now, each of these groups daily produces a written list of the things that they've come up with. And essentially, if you put it into a report format for them, they can learn a lot about how they would uh, write, and you learn a lot about their ability to write at the same time. So by identifying those specific types of, of permissible and non-permissible things, you start to get an idea of where they're thinking. Now, your job as the teacher here is to represent every other class that has come through uh, during the day. So regardless of which class you're in, you're representing the other classes. That way you have one set of guidelines that all six or seven classes follow. On day three, we start drafting initial guidelines. And these establish the permissions and the actions and behaviors to avoid and some of the penalties that are associated with it. Uh, the last time I did this, we had a, um, a permission of um, eating in the classroom. And that was something that uh, a lot of students were concerned about um, because they didn't always get a chance to get breakfast or get lunch uh, at the time that they were hungry, so they wanted to eat. And one of the behaviors that came out of it, one of the penalties that came out of it was that if um, someone left trash behind or left food behind in the classroom, that the entire class would not be allowed to eat for a week. That was their guideline. I was ready to just say, okay, in the one day, um, but their guideline was a lot stricter than mine, and they adhered to it when it did occur. Day four, we negotiate the final drafts, and we identify the penalties and benefits of each specific activity. And then finally, on day five, we clarify and finalize all of the guidelines. We create a big document Collectively, people write out the guidelines, and then we have a signing ceremony. And I usually have all of the students in all of the classes sign the same document. And then we have one of the students in each class create the document on a Word document and send it out to everyone so everybody has a copy of it. During this whole process, they're learning the key employability skills. They're learning how to collaborate. They're learning how to use the computers. They're how, learning how to think critically about 
problems that may arise and how to overcome those problems. They're learning how to work together in teams, and this supports so many of the different learning styles uh, for CTE students. It's extremely beneficial. I've yet to not complete my school year because I did this at the beginning, and I've typically found that once these guidelines are in place, the rest of the school year goes extremely smooth. So now let's take a look at the effective physical designs of a 21st century classroom. Back in the 20th century, which wasn't that long ago, uh, our classrooms had, they were very structured. Uh, they were structured to support a specific routine. Seats were in rows. This resulted in seat work. Um, the whole concept here was an expansion from the 19th century model of the factory. We had the teacher at the head of the class, and they had authoritarian control over the students. The teacher told, the students listened. So here's a picture from the 1950s that shows just this. We have the boys separated to one side of the room, the girls to the other side of the room, everyone doing the same thing the teacher at the head of the class, and that's how learning took place. Did it change much in 40 years? Not really. By the 1990s, we still had teachers in rows, or students in rows, although now boys and girls were sitting together, they were no longer separated. The teacher was still at the head of the classroom, and everybody was doing the same thing reading from a book or doing that same behavior. So what's changed in the 21st century? Well, some innovative classrooms today have really flexible seating that fosters creativity. Students get into planning areas. They can move their classroom around. They get into planning areas. They get into collaboration areas, and they can work to solve problems. Teachers in this type of uh, a situation are supportive. They're supporting the student exploration. And if you look in this classroom in the picture above, there's five or six teachers in there. And by teachers, I mean students teaching their fellow students. Classrooms today should have a makerspace in it. Uh, and if you don't know what a makerspace is right now, uh, these are fantastic opportunities for students to learn by doing putting into application the things that they learn and trying, exploring new ideas. They should have a thinker space, a space where students can separate themselves and start thinking about things um, to metacognitively approach the content, thinking about thinking in a quiet space. They need a research space, a place where they can go out and find more information on their own because we want them to be learners. We want them to be in control of their own learning. And you need a group space. And that group space is fantastic for <coughs> covering all of the things that you need to cover as a class. And that could be teacher-led lectures, student-led lectures, debates, etc. So we're going to talk about uh, work teams now briefly to get an idea of why work teams are really important. Work teams, I usually form them using student selection. And when I start this uh, process, I make sure I say to the students, um, don't choose someone who's just your friend. Choose the people who you think will help support doing all the different things that need to be done. So look at all of the things that you may be doing this year and choose the people for your group who have expertise in those areas. I encourage the, the groups to rotate leadership so everyone in the group gets a chance to be uh, in charge, and the student groups decide when that occurs. That may be weekly, it could be monthly. It depends on how many people are in the group and how often they want to change. The leaders manage the team. They're there to take things like attendance, make sure that the students are in the right place each day, that they're following the uh, guidelines of the classroom. They're the first line of uh, support for uh, the students in the group. If the students in the group have a question, they could ask other members of the group, ask their team leader, and then come to the teacher uh, for a final answer. 
So some of the things take attendance, solve team issues, collect team assignments, and they focus the team on the day's activities. The team leaders then communicate together to allocate the resources of the classroom. In other words, there's different workstations that they need to adhere to uh, or go to each day, and they need to be divided up. Define the areas by day, who's gonna be where, and resolve inter-team issues. Two teams may come to the same place and wanna be in the same place the same day, and the leaders work to resolve these issues. All of this supports project-based learning, which is the next thing that we're gonna take a quick look at. So project-based learning is something uh, that develops a series of lifelong learning skills necessary for future employment. It's very student-centered, it improves understanding and exploration, and encourages learning from experience. So key aspects of PBL, mastery of core academic content. When we're asking students to think critically about something, they need to have a mastery of the core academic content. I can't ask you to think critically about something that you don't know. Critical thinking and solving complex problems. Solving complex problems, again, needs that mastery of core academic content. So if we're gonna learn these skills, we really need to support the academic content. They learn how to work collaboratively in PBL communicate effectively, they learn that they're in charge of their learning, they learn that they can be successful academically and have an academic mindset. So instead of thinking that academics is something that they can't achieve in, they learn that academics in a CTE classroom using project-based learning is something where they can be successful. So let's, now let's talk about classroom features. Workstations, I briefly talked about workstations earlier, and workstations are uh, a system that uh, I've used in the past several times, and I've found them to be extremely effective in providing opportunity uh, for attachment points for different types of learning. So uh, when I set up a workstation classroom, I set up a maker space, and it can be a small space off to one side, or it could be your entire classroom. It depends on how your classroom is configured. They tend to foster student-centered solutions. Present it with a problem. Students have to come up, use the resources that they have in the makerspace to come up with a solution. Usually in a makerspace, a student will develop a series of uh, solutions and put those into a portfolio. So those uh, items in the portfolio can be used in the future by other classes and other students to solve the same types of problems. The students are free to create examples that solve the problems using that sample portfolio or creating an entirely new idea. I usually stock the makerspace with some craft items, the materials used in the, the field under study, the tools, um, uh, workbooks and things like that, uh, field journals that they can use to refer to. I include the tools and devices to adapt the materials so they get an understanding of how to look uh, at these things and use the tools that they would in the field. And then I also create a display area for items that they produce in the makerspace. One of the key things um, of making sure that students understand uh, what they create is a real and has a real uh, purpose is to display that. These are great spaces for kinesthetic learners. They're great for in interpersonal learners, uh, people who work together in groups. It builds a strong collaborative group, usually in a workspace, a maker a makerspace workstation. So next, let's take a look at the thinkerspace. Uh, thinkerspaces, uh, in the past, you saw these sometimes in English language arts classrooms for reading. Uh, but thinkerspaces create spaces where individuals and small groups can sit and critically examine a problem. They can sit and think about it. They can discuss. They can plan. They can figure out ways to overcome the issues. Once they've collected the information, 
they need a place to organize their thoughts, be able to write down what they, they think may be the uh, answers or the solutions to their problems. I usually stock it with drawing paper and tablets, and by tablets I mean iPads, so they have a chance to research and uh, uh, fill out information, sketch things out, make uh, graphic representations of uh, what their ideas are. I tend to remove distractions by putting up uh, little blocking walls like uh, cubicle walls around them. So when they're in there, they're still visible to the classroom, but they're not right on top of everyone else. I put comfortable seating and lighting in there so they can sit and read and feel comfortable uh, while they're doing it. And I poster the area around it with different steps to critical thinking and problem solving, like, uh, for example, the SMART process, specific, measurable, attainable, uh, uh, relevant, and time-bound uh, on the wall so they can work through those steps. And I add in a word wall and encourage them whenever they come into a space like this, if they find a word, to put it up on the word wall. And if you look up there in the middle, that uh, word wall isn't populated yet, but that's uh, because this is at the beginning of the semester. Great support for visual, intrapersonal, and logical mathematical learners. Uh, having the space to sit and think clearly really aids these uh, types of learners in their process. So our next space is the research space, and I found that this is one that gets quickly populated. Um, I keep computers and printers there, and students tend to jump onto these right away because they found that they can solve a lot of their problems quickly by jumping on a computer and doing some quick research. I put a collaborative display with each uh, um, research space, so one computer can drive the display and the students can work together as a group rather than a bunch of students working individually on different computers. It's a small group area for planning as well. It's uh, something where they can do their planning up on the collaborative screen. And it's a collaboration center to be able to work out problems in the research uh, format before they get into a makerspace. I also use it as the class library. We store a lot of journals and, and books in, the, in that area. And it's a really great support for logical, mathematical, visual, and interpersonal learners. The last space we're going to look at is the group space. And this is a whole class collaboration area. I like to have an area in the center of the classroom. I typically will set up chairs in a chevron or tables in a chevron where uh, there's enough room for two of the uh, classroom groups to meet at the same time, uh, but close enough to the other areas where we can pull chairs up and make one big whole class space at the same time. It's great for class discussion. It's a great presentation space because uh, each week I like to have the students present their solutions. Uh, it's great for teacher-led lectures and for student-led lectures. It's excellent for debates because you can quickly organize it into uh, uh, the type of debate that I like to have, and that's the convincing debate where students uh, choose their sides based on their initial perspective of the issue and then move from one side of the line to the other depending on where they end up after hearing other people's arguments. It's great for panel discussions where one group wants to present their information in a panel format where they can, everyone in the group gets a chance to talk to the rest of the students about what they did and then answer questions from the group. Excellent for jigsaws as well. And it's the perfect opportunity for interpersonal, visual, and auditory learners uh, to attach to the content. So some classroom features, uh, support areas uh, for storage or makerspace materials. I like to use them for common tool storage, class, library, industry journals, word wall, technical terms. And I like these all to be really close to where they're going to be used. Next, I, I want to talk about the workstation's design. 
Uh, workstations really fit the space to the need instead of the other way around, trying to fit the need to the space. The best example of this is the Starbucks model. If you walk into a Starbucks, you're going to see a variety of different seating arrangements. There are going to be chairs and tables, couches, small groupings, individual chairs set off to the side, maybe a row of uh, stools facing a wall with a counter in front of it. And if you walk in there, you'll see people using all of these spaces depending on what their needs are at that time. Replace the desks in your classroom with tables and chairs if you can. There should be different areas for different needs like we talked about. You can mark out spaces on the floor using tape, which really fits uh, um, the CTE format. Gets students used to recognizing that some spaces are for walkways, some spaces are for specific areas. Bring in comfortable seating. Um, I had a very good principal who was very welcoming to uh, comfortable seating being brought in and was very supportive uh, with providing uh, people to help move it into my classroom. I like to introduce music, and this is one of the things that often comes up in the guidelines. And usually in the guidelines, we establish whether it can be individual, whether it's class choice, how to raise and lower the volume, what level it should be set at. Provide task lighting if, you're, if you have a uh, maker space or if you have a um, quiet study area or if you have a research area. Each of those spaces needs to have specific types of task lighting. <coughs> if you put one computer per table, then you don't have to populate the entire class with computers, but there'll be enough computers to go around for each group to use. And like I said, orient those storage spaces in proximity to the work areas. And this final thing, I don't know how many of you would be comfortable with it. I wasn't at first, but uh, once I did it, I loved it. Uh, I eliminated the teacher desk in the classroom, and I just had an area next to uh, my projector. I kept my teacher desk back in the um, teacher lounge, and it worked really well because it freed up a lot of space in the classroom and made me a much more integrated part of the classroom rather than being able to retreat to my desk. So let's talk about how to use workstations in a middle school technology classroom. Uh, simple unit plan on communication. My lesson plan for this particular uh, period is identifying and simulating the parts of the message. So if you know a little bit about telecommunications, you know that there are five parts of a message. The sender, the encoder, the message itself, and the media travels on the decoder and the receiver. So starting with that bit of information, in the makerspace, my sample activity for a makerspace would be using the portfolio, create an example of the parts of the message. So the students who are in the makerspace would look through what they have available in the space and create a physical example of showing those five parts. In the thinkerspace, I would ask the students to analyze how messages could be sent over distance using the existing technology. In the research space, my sample activity would be comparing and contrasting historical versus modern methods of creating and transmitting messages. And then in the group space, I would ask the group that's there, the two groups, to develop a different physical representation of how messages are transmitted and to assess which method that they have looked at is the best method that we could teach to the whole class so they could understand the process. Now, typically when I set up a lesson plan like this, I have four different three by five cards at each space in a small three by five box. And each one of those three by five cards holds a problem. And for example, that problem in the makerspace, the first card may say, create an example of the parts of a message using something from the portfolio. 
Inside the box are three more problems that would revolve around this same concept. And the first group that got there has the chance to choose from among the four. The second group has three that remain. This, the third group has two to choose from. And the last group only has one to choose from. That way, uh, groups tend to go to the best space that they want to each week. And remember back when I said the leaders get together, the leaders get together on Friday afternoons or Friday at the end of their class, the last five minutes, and they decide where each group is going to be the next week. Now, I didn't come up with that idea. One of the students in my class did, and it worked phenomenally. The group leaders got together. They met with their groups ahead of time, decided where they wanted to be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They got to those spaces, uh, signed up for them for the next week, and it eliminated any contention over who was going to be in which space. My initial, initial thought was first come, first serve, but this method worked so much better. It was essentially a reservation, and the students put it together themselves. Now, I didn't mention Friday, because on Friday, each of the groups got to choose what they thought was their best solution from the week, whether it was from their makerspace opportunity, the thinker space, the research space, or the group space. And then they would present that idea to the group on Friday. The group, the class group, would then decide which activity was best, which one fit the need best, and that particular one got the honor of going into the portfolio from that space. So using this method of workstations really engages the students in learning. It really engages them in the practice of being involved in their own efforts. So to conclude this today, uh, middle school classrooms, especially those in CTE, require a purposeful adjustment to your teaching style. Your classroom design and a lesson planning. You need to open up the space for exploration. Middle school students need to feel comfortable in that, uh, the fact that they can explore uh, and come to you for support. So where can you begin if this is something that you're interested in? I'd say first you need to identify your teaching style. And if you find that you can adapt or you already are an authoritarian teacher, that's the place to start from. Next, take a look at your classroom. Talk with your principal. See how you can redesign your classroom to fit the need of the classroom. Third, review your curriculum. Identify workstation divisions. How are the areas I can, uh, um, the areas of my curriculum that I can take apart and build? You might think, wow, I don't have the time to fit all of the objectives that I have for a year into a division. And this is a lot of work to create. You'll find that if you create one or two, the first time you do this, the students will help you create the rest. They'll create the portfolios. They'll create the problems. They'll suggest ideas to you. It's a way of getting the students directly involved in not only their learning, but the learning for future classrooms. Adjust your lesson plans from a day's concept to unit concepts. In other words, I want to cover all of this material and I'm going to do it in these different ways on the same day. So instead of saying I have to cover five things this week, one on each day, you're covering all five on each day to the same students in different ways. So they get a chance to learn in a different way each time. Make sure you design a makerspace beginning portfolio, and then collect the needed materials you need for the makerspace. And then finally, and this is right from Harry and Rosemary Wong, draft a first week guide. Draft that guide for success. And that way you can have a really effective uh, uh, classroom management experience and really enhance the learning for your CTE middle school students. So quick wrap up, if you have any questions, you can reach me, uh, I'm Dr. Mario Minichino uh, at uh, CTEC Associates in Sparta, New Jersey. 
Uh, you can reach me via email or you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, staying through today's uh, seminar to the end and uh, have a great experience in your classroom. Thank you so much, Mario. I really appreciate um, you participating with ACT in this online seminar. It was absolutely fantastic. And thank you again to all of our attendees, um, or to all of our viewers watching today. Um, again, if there's any, um, if you have any questions about online seminars, feel free to check out ACT's online seminar page. Um, that will be at actonline.org. And again, keep a lookout on our Twitter and Facebook pages for more updates um, about some upcoming online seminars over the next few months. So thank you again, and hope everyone has a fantastic rest of the day.